I just wanted to thank uh, Mayor Ron and thank Gerd and thank you, the Georgetown campus here. It's been a pleasure visiting here and I hope to come back more. Uh, and it's always nice to get out here. You've got some wonderful resources here. So uh, I think every visiting academic looks quite enviously at what you've got here. So uh, it, it's looking really good. Um, I was at a bit of a, I suppose, um, I was wondering what to talk about uh, when, when I came here. And essentially what I'm going to talk about is the contents of a paper I wrote for the Arabian Studies Journal uh, about a year or so back. And uh, what I thought I'd do was look at the late 1960s, when Britain said it was going to leave the Gulf, when it said it was going to announce, what it announced it was going to leave the Gulf within, I guess, four years, in January 1968, and talk about some of the territorial issues it needed to confront. And I was going to look at one in particular, and that is the, just a bit to the south of here, the sort of uh, intersection of boundaries and territorial claims, if you like, between Qatar. Uh, but mainly between Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia. It was an interesting little story. I'm going to talk about the things that I know that I've come across in the British records, but I'm sure there's lots of people here who may know quite a bit more about me than uh, various things, and I'd be delighted to learn from you equally. So um, let's just uh, go on here. Um, I hope you can see these maps. You won't be able to see the detail on them, but... Um, I suppose uh, the sort of our, the area we're going to be talking about access corridor through the Hurla Day mainly, but one or two other things as well. Um, let's move on to another slide. Um, when we talked about the late 1960s, um, Britain was faced with a whole set of territorial issues between protected states, between protected states and their, their neighbors, uh, mainly Saudi Arabia and Iran, um, and Iraq as well. And uh, so what were the bigger questions? If we go back to the map, I suppose that might be useful. Um, what were the biggest set of questions if we look back at the late 1960s? There was the Northern Gulf, there were worries, uh, which have been around ever since the late 1930s, for the security questions which were posed by Kuwait and its boundary dispute with Iraq. And there was a realization that once Britain had said it was going to leave in 1968, um, that Britain simply wouldn't be able to protect Kuwait against the contingency of Iraqi attack in 71. That comes across very, very strongly in the recently released British Foreign Office documents. It was much more of an issue than I assumed, if you like, when I wrote the book that uh, Gerd talked about a couple of decades ago. And there was the sort of constant advice, uh, generally, that British officials would offer to Kuwait in saying it might be worth making the odd territorial concession the sort of things that Iraq is hankering after might be in your own interest in the long term. And that had been unchanging advice ever since British Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax said that stuff back in the late 1930s. Elsewhere, um, well, in 1967, um, I, was, I won't give you the detail now, but I was particularly taken uh, by uh, a few quotes looking forward to a future grouping of, of Arab states on the western side of the Gulf in 1967, the, the year before uh, Britain announced it was leaving. And they had an ambassador, a guy called Ran Ranald Boyle, uh, here in, in Doha. And he made the point that, you know, we've really got to do a bit more. Um, the project, a future sort of, uh, sort of Gulf, Arab Gulf, without Britain around, was termed Gulfery at this time. Gulfery, I think it's a sort of weird term, but it was called Gulfery. It was codenamed Gulfery. And they thought that people like Bahrain and Qatar, those two states, needed to be pushed into cooperating quite a bit more. And there were all sorts of quotes that year, if you like, in 67, about how this thing called oil is making contestation every, every square foot and kilometre much worse than it ever was. So there was a sort of hankering for the past, the way things were if you like. 
Uh, then if we move on to 1968, and I'm not going to try and uh, sort of uh, cover the... Uh, I'm very happy to take questions at the end of this talk on any of the territorial disputes of the region. I've spent far, long looking, far too long looking at them. But if we think of the, uh, the lower Gulf Islands dispute over Abu Musa and the Toms, we think about the sort of urgings at the time that Iran find a way to drop its claim to Bahrain. Um, throughout 1968, Britain's first priority, I suppose, was to try and get a bit of movement on a number of issues with Iran, uh, looking forward to the future, looking forward to a future where Iran's cooperation was really going to be counted upon in future security arrangements for the Gulf. And one of the things that um, was really troubling the states around this time was the failure of Saudi Arabia and Iran to finalize a boundary agreement so that they could open up the hydrocarbon reserves of the northern Gulf. And that really was the main American preoccupation when we think back to 1968. America had an ambassador called Armin Meyer at the time, and he was the first person to put a linkage proposal to the Shah. He did this back in March uh, 1968, and he basically said, look, we need a package of agreements uh, sort of sorted out. We need uh, you to find a way to drop your claim to Bahrain. We'll try and work out by a British through British auspices, a way in which you can get you know, ownership of those islands in the lower Gulf. And, uh, and also, we, we want to see a maritime boundary uh, agreement uh, signed between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which will allow the oil companies in to develop this area. So let's do all these things at once in a sort of linkage. Um, and then... The uh, British ambassador at the time, uh, Wright, uh, Dennis Wright in, in, in um, Iran, uh, said, well, we're not, going to be, we're not going to link things quite so expressly. We'll have a package. We'll have an overall sort of umbrella package where all these things could be sort of negotiated at the same time. So a face-saving formula for the Shah to drop the claim to Bahrain, uh, uh, possible negotiations on the future fate of the lower Gulf Islands, and the clear hint was that, well, obviously, the, the sort of Abu Musa is south of a median line and the Tums are north of a median line. So we could see in the end that maybe the Tums would probably go to Iran, et cetera, et cetera. But Britain didn't expressly link all these things. It said there's a package and each item of that package needs, needs to be negotiated. In the end, uh, the Shah disagreed and, and thought that the future independence of Bahrain was too important uh, to be uh, linked in this way. Or that's what the, the sort of things seem to suggest, the record for 68. He wanted them to be able to uh, actually decide their own fate, as they would do in 70 or 71. So by the end of 68, 69, there wasn't too much enthusiasm that this linkage would work. So Iraq, therefore, or Kuwait was going to be, uh, Britain wasn't going to be involved in the future of that question. The bahrain Qatar dispute, we can talk about that in questions. I won't go on too much of it, uh, about it too much today. And the lower Gulf Islands. Um, you know, by the end of 68, 69, Britain was of the opinion that there probably wouldn't be a big package deal to, to solve these problems. Um, you know, it came back in thinking there might be in 71, but I'm looking at the late 60s here. So uh, I think what we'll now do is have a look at um, this sort of part of the world uh, to the southeast of Qatar. And one of the reasons that I suppose it's, it's very interesting to look at this region is that there was a boundary agreement um, that, we can show it here, that was signed in 1974. I'm jumping forward here because it's a very hard one to explain. It was signed between Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia in 1974. And the basic deal was that in return for dropping its claim to Buremi about Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia got its own sort of access corridor, the reality of an access corridor, uh, 
through Le Coral Adé, admitted in 1974. That was the basic deal that wasn't actually talked about in any detail in the text of the agreement, but it was the basic deal that made the agreement possible. But the agreement of 74 was bizarre in many, many ways. Uh, for the way in which it dealt with both offshore and onshore boundary definition. For a start, the Sheba or Zarara oil field, even though in the 1974 agreement, even though two thirds of it was specified as lying in Saudi Arabia, the Sheba field, and one third of it in Abu Dhabi, uh, the, the Zarara field, according to the treaty, um, and I've got the excerpt from it now, all hydrocarbons in that field shall be considered as belonging to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the second provision of that article says, the United Arab Emirates agrees and undertakes not to engage in or permit any exploration or drilling for exploitation of diddle diddle in that part of the field lying north of the boundary line. Furthermore, Saudi Arabia was allowed to develop the resources of the field that lay within the territory of Abu Dhabi. Uh, so it's very, very strange. And when it came to its specification of offshore arrangements, it was bizarre as well. One or two islands were specified as belonging to Saudi Arabia, but other ones were specified as belonging to Abu Dhabi, but uh, Saudi Arabia had the right to construct military installations on them. You know, so it was a bizarre agreement in many ways. And I think the only way in which you can make sense of it is to go back, which I'm now going to do, to looking at this question in the late 1960s. And we're just going to run through a few quotes and a few maps. Obviously, the Saudi-UAE dispute in the, in the period since has been uh, on and off over their, their, their western boundary and over the Zarara Sheba thing. Um, for about 20 years, we heard nothing of it. In fact, the text of a 1974 agreement wasn't available until uh, the early 1990s. Then it became available in 93, and everyone realized what the text had said. In the meantime, of course, the, the oil market, the oil price in the early 90s was very flat. There was a massive incentive for all the states to maximize oil production. So Saudi Arabia announced it was going to open the Sheba field in the early 90s. And of course, one state didn't turn up to the opening ceremony, and that was Abu Dhabi, because um, it was pretty unhappy with the arrangements which had been introduced. Uh, we wait another 10 years, and then we have the death in quick succession of the rulers of Saudi Arabia and, uh, well, of, of, of the United Arab Emirates and then Saudi Arabia. The two sides agree to go to negotiations in 2005. They don't get quite what they want at those negotiations, and they break down quite, quite quickly. And almost as if smarting from the breakdown of such uh, sort of negotiations, um, we find this rather strange entry in the UAE 2006 yearbook. Um, produced by their Ministry of Information. And it shows the boundaries, if you like, that the UAE would rather were, were it belong to it. Uh, so in the Khoral Adaid, it shows that as belonging to the UAE. And in the south, where the oil field structure is, again, it shows that as beginning, be, belonging to the UAE. And uh, this, this did reflect frustration that negotiations hadn't worked. Um, and it was portrayed at the time that these were the boundaries in respect of cultural and historic truths, not the legal boundaries. We weren't disputing the legal boundaries, which were different. And of course, there have been one or two difficulties in more recent times, including a little naval, uh, a very minor skirmish in 2010. So there is an issue there. It's not one that's likely to lead to conflict, or I'm, I'm not overplaying it, but there are difficulties with this particular boundary. Let's go back to some of the reasons why there might have been difficulties in the first place. A lot of this relates to the sort of 
offshore boundaries and the onshore boundaries in this part of the world being negotiated at different times and in a different way. There was an agreement signed between Saudi Arabia and Qatar in December 1965. And this had been signed, concluded, between uh, um, Qatar and Saudi Arabia outside uh, Britain's consent, if you want. Britain was nominally responsible for the conduct of Qatar's foreign relations at this time. And this wasn't the first time it had happened. Bahrain and Saudi Arabia agreed the first joint development zone that we'd ever seen back in 1958, pretty much anywhere, a template for future actions. And again, that had been agreed autonomously when British-sponsored negotiations didn't work out. But because the uh, conclusions were to everybody's liking, including Britain, it didn't mind too much. But with this one in 1965, that Britain's objection was that a boundary had been agreed which went along the whole base of the Qatar Peninsula and recognized the whole of the boundary as separating Saudi Arabia and Qatar. There was no Abu Dhabi boundary with Qatar. Or, uh, that's why Britain objected, because back in the late um, 19th century, Britain had said that, or recognized that Abu Dhabi had rights over the Khurala Day. So it believed that in signing this agreement, the rights of Abu Dhabi had been trampled pretty much all over. Um, so there we were. Uh, the, um, there are people in this room who know the relationship between Qatar and Saudi Arabia as academics and have been uh, researching that better than I do. Um, but in many ways, the agreement did ratify what had been the, the existing territorial control in this area for quite a long time although Britain was existing, was merely sort of trying to recognize things it, it, it had recognized before. Of course, around this time as well, we had um, a ruler in Abu Dhabi, Shaq Bout, who maintained claims, um, again, in a, in a way that perhaps reflected traditional nodes of territorial control, which was the way in which a lot of the Gulf operated in terms of uh, its territoriality. A lot of it was exercised from sea and the control of this node and that node. And Shaq Boot's uh, claims to areas like Umm Said, north of here, and to other areas were, were messy in certain, certain ways. And uh, to cut a long story short, of course, he was replaced as leader in the spring to the summer of 1966, and he was replaced by Zayed, uh, uh, who was a more pragmatic ruler. Um, so then we were faced with a question where Saudi Arabia was increasingly asking Qatar to ratify that agreement they'd signed in 65, and Britain had to square that with rights that it had always protected for Abu Dhabi. And uh, again, you probably can't read the detail too much, but there were two important meetings in the, I think, in the early spring of 1967 and the late winter of 1968, where the ruler uh, of, where, where Gata played host to its two neighbors in a walk around the core, the core of the day. The first time, it met Sheikh, uh, it met Zayed himself, and um, the question was, for Britain, they were supposed to be putting a marker on the Khorola Day which showed where the boundary was. And it was supposed to be the western extremity of the Khorola Day. For whatever reason, it ended up being placed at the southern extremity of the Khorola Day, and there was no great uh, meeting of minds after the... It didn't work in settling the boundary. As much as anything, because Saudi Arabia still believed in the 1965 treaty, what that had done. By the time that the Saudis were received uh, by the Qataris in February 1968, they traversed the whole of the boundary that they had agreed a few years earlier. At that point, uh, 
Britain probably decided that there was not much point in pretending anymore, in, realistically, that Abu Dhabi still had uh, rights over the Khorola Day. They may as well, from that point, begin to recognize the reality that, if you like, it was a Saudi Gattari concern. But if we go back to the map here, the offshore map, we had two bizarre realities developing here. We had, on one level, you had boundary here as a gap. But the offshore component of the boundary is a British Gattari concern or a uh, Gattari. Um, even though it was the same boundary, even though the terminus of the land boundary was used again. Because in March 1969, Abu Dhabi and Qatar signed a maritime boundary. They signed a maritime boundary, which terminated at the point where Qatar and Saudi Arabia had agreed their land boundary. So you had one boundary in international law, a maritime component and a land boundary component, but you had a different sovereign, sovereign, sovereign in, in each particular case. So it was, a, it was an unusual and messy situation. You don't see it replicated anywhere else. The, we then saw a tiny bit of urgency, I guess, to, um, as Britain was thinking about you know, getting closer to 1970, uh, 71, it started saying that the FCO was started saying, well, aren't, aren't we sure we can't push for a few more agreements? You know, I mean, let's have one last, let's want to have one last go because, uh, you know, they could be the sort of source of petty jealousies, jealousies for many years to come. I use the language of the, of, of, of that's actually in the archives. And then we had people like Donald McCarthy, who would be, uh, who was an FCO official, an Arabist who had become the ambassador in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, he said, well, we've tried. We've tried for ages. We don't think we can get uh, agreement on some of these issues. If they're not going to threaten security, shouldn't we just, you know, leave them uh, and, and get, get the, uh, our protégés to talk to each other or whatever? Uh, so... There was a bit of a, a sort of toing and froing at this time about whether a big effort should be made to actually push through more agreements. And one of the things that Britain thought about uh, the, the Saudi frontier of Abu Dhabi was that obviously relations uh, have been um, uh, frozen pretty much since the Suez crisis and the Bahraini crisis. And because of that, Britain didn't really think there was much prospect in Saudi Arabia ever relaxing its territorial claims around this region, around this time. And so it was a bit of a surprise in April 1970 when Zayed, in the context of possible talk of mediation from both Pakistan and Iran, uh, came forward with this um, sort of basis of offering something to Zayed to get the, the, the boundary uh, question settled. And I think everyone knew what the deal was that was on the offing. I mentioned at the beginning, the Saudi train, uh, claim to Bahrami would be dropped and this access corridor through Khorol Adade would be admitted, pretty much as a deal, pretty much as a deal. Um, it could also have been, though, that uh, Faisal in, in Saudi Arabia was, um, was mindful that Britain had just discovered an awful lot of oil at that oil field I mentioned at the very beginning, um, Sheba uh, Zarara, the transboundary structure. Uh, it was already thought to be a significant oil field and, and British-based British oil interests, which were based in Abu Dhabi, were very much at that area. So in many, many ways, uh, Britain was now a tiny bit concerned. It was, it was very, very encouraged that, um, you know, here was the prospect of a boundary uh, question. There, may, there might be progress in future negotiations. But it was slightly worried um, when it heard that um, Zayed might be willing to adjust the boundary in Saudi Arabia's 
uh, favor. And in the end, uh, he went off to some talks in Saudi Arabia, Zayed, and uh, he was advised to proceed with extreme caution over any offer of territorial concessions. And then, again, it got a bit, the concern got a bit more. The danger, as I see it, is that Zayed maybe came overawed, lose his nerve, and yield on points of substance. So there was a worry, if you like, that all the, the major oil find of Zarara might all of a sudden, that area, be given over to Saudi Arabia. Um, one of the reasons, one of the obvious reasons that Qatar, all throughout this time, it didn't ratify the 1965 agreement uh, with Saudi Arabia because Britain was putting that pressure on. But one of the reasons it wanted to keep that agreement was that Saudi Arabia was offering Qatar a much more favorable territorial concession in the Khurul Adaid region than previous Abu Dhabi claims would have admitted. So it was getting a better deal, if you like, from Saudi Arabia. Um, so where did we go after all this? Well, they, they met. Um, 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 basically, the, the Saudis uh, said, we want territorial concessions in the area of the oil field. We want them in the Coral Adade region. Uh, we'll have a plebiscite in the Bahraini region, which was one way of admitting, finding a, a formula to step down from the claim there. Um, but in the end, um, the uh, Zayed and Abu Dhabi never gave them, never gave the Saudis the reply to, to Faisal's proposals. Um, oil operations were frozen in the area of Zarara and Sheba. Um, in the end, um, there was lots of statements from Saudi Arabia saying that, well, if, if the United Arab Emirates wants recognition, you know, we've got to settle our boundary questions. But in the end, I think Britain calculated, possibly correctly, that if we didn't go, go if we didn't force an agreement through, it wouldn't be fatal for, for the security of this region. So it was left to boil a little bit. And they kind of said, well, what can we say? We can say we've done our best to encourage Sayyid to come further to meet Faisal's proposals, disappointing that we haven't succeeded. Nonetheless, a lot of progress has been made. So they looked at these sort of things. Um, so in reviewing here, what had happened? Um, well, Britain's chief difficulty in trying to refute the 65 agreement was in trying to, uh, originally was in trying to moderate Abu Dhabi's traditional claims. Um, it had no way of convincing Gata that, uh, you know, upholding Abu Dhabi's claims was in, in its interest. As I said, we moved to a rather nonsensical position where the southern Gatari land boundary was seen as a Saudi concern, yet its southeastern maritime limits are British one, reflected in those two agreements. Until the old find at Zarara, again in 1970, we looked to be moving towards a trade-off of Bahraini and Khural Day, which in fact we basically got in 74. Um, Ultimately, Britain believed that the failure to secure an agreement between the two sides wouldn't threaten the security of a future UAE. But one concession, one consequence, I suppose, of this whole business, and of the particularly over the oil field, uh, Zarara, uh, Sheba. Let me just see if I've got one map at the end. I think I did have one. Oh, I didn't. I've left it off. Sorry about that. Let's go back to it was that King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, um, in the 1974 agreement, um, you know, pretty much held out for Saudis right over the whole oil field structure. And um, obviously, that was the, the tipping point, looking back to 1970. It was that whole discovery of the oil there that meant that a deal probably didn't go through in the 70 to 71 period. Uh, but in the 74 agreement, uh, perhaps mindful of what had happened a few years earlier, there was a Saudi determination not to uh, recognize the UAE rights over, over the oil fields. Again, it's only speculation, and I've heard several explanations for it. 
Um, the 74 agreement was a, basically thrashed out, and I think uh, Oman was present there as well at an Islamic summit in Lahore early in uh, January 1974. And at that meeting, one version I've heard is that Saudi Arabia was prepared to give more territory been talk about it as a neutral zone, whatever, over the previous years. It was prepared to give a recognition to the Emirates that the territory belongs to you, but not the resources. So that's perhaps why you ended up with this hugely bizarre provision whereby a transboundary oil field belongs all to one state and not the other. So I'll leave it there. We can, we can talk about, you know, questions uh, in in detail, not just about this boundary, but about related ones, if you like. Uh, and I've realized I've gone through very quickly, but I think it is quite an interesting story. And it tells us quite a lot about messy boundary agreements. And there's usually an explanation that lies in the history. I'll leave it there. Thanks.